from Matthew chapter 1 um, and the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. <coughs> I won't read, but Bernie will refer to that um, during his message. Verse 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then down to verse 17, continuing. Thus there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. May God bless his word. Well, good morning, everybody. What a pleasure it is to be with you again. Um, I was here quite some time ago, I think, um, and uh, I spoke then on taming the tongue from James's letter. Uh, this is a little bit different this morning. <clears throat> it's great to be with you, and thank you for your words of welcome. Let's, uh, let us come before God in prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to, to serve you by hearing your word, by learning, by studying it, and then by sharing it with those around us. Grant, Lord, your blessing upon these words this morning as I bring them to your people. May they be your words, not mine. And may your name be praised and glorified, not mine. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I've got to say right from the outset, whoever chose that children's video, well done. That was fantastic. And uh, it's also great to see some guys out the front leading the singing. It's fantastic. I don't know what it is about Australian men, but they have these inhibitions about singing. Um, you know, they just don't. And uh, I've never understood why. But uh, it's great to see. And, and thank you also for the very generous chocolates here. Uh, <laughs> okay, I know, they're not mine. <clears throat> you know, when I looked at this passage of scripture that Pastor Paul um, uh, decided would be today's reading, I, I looked at that and I said, yeah, good on you, Paul. <laughs> Thanks very much for that. <laughs> what do I do with something like this? The genealogy of Jesus. And... Um, I spared Ruth and I spared you the details of, of reading through that, but by all means read through it. We're going to take a bit of a look at that. So let's get into this. And our objective today, of course, is to ask ourselves, what can we do with this story, including the genealogy? What's that got to do with the birth of Jesus? And what can we take home from this that will will welcome in the new day tomorrow and the, new, the dawning of a new era. Well, let's take a look at it. Dr. Henry Van Dyke. Anyone heard that name before? He's not the brother of Dick Van Dyke. Uh, he's a little bit older than Dick Van Dyke. Dr. Henry Van Dyke, born in 1852 and died in 1933. He was a Presbyterian minister 
and a professor of English literature uh, at Princeton University, New Jersey. And he once said this, and this struck a chord with me, if four witnesses should appear before a judge to give an account of a certain event, and each should tell exactly the same story in the same words, the judge would probably conclude not that their testimony was exceptionally valuable, but that the only event which was certain beyond a doubt was that they had agreed to tell the same story. But if each man had told what he had seen, as he had seen it, then the evidence would be credible. And when we read the four Gospels, is not that exactly what we find? The four men tell the same story, each in his own way. And that's the end of the quotation. <clears throat> well, if you've taken the trouble to read the four Gospels, or study them, you would have noticed quite a number of things. You would have noticed, for example, you would know, first of all, that the, the, the first gospel was Mark's gospel, and that it's the shortest one. It has nothing to do, it has no reference to the nativity, to the birth of Jesus. It starts with the baptism of Jesus and John the Baptist. So it really cuts to the chase. Matthew and Luke uh, wrote in their Gospels and much of what is contained in Mark's Gospel. John, uh, John's Gospel came a little bit later uh, and each one of these had a different purpose, a different reason for writing their Gospels. What you will find in one, you will find in the others, but not necessarily in the same words and not even in the same sequence. And one of the most interesting things about that is the timing, for example, of Jesus feeding the 5,000. It differs depending on which gospel you are reading. Interesting. Today we're focusing on Matthew's gospel. And what was behind Matthew's gospel and why did he write that? What was behind it? First of all, it's important to remember that Matthew was a Jew and he was writing to an audience of Jews of Orthodox Jews. That in itself is a tough gig to talk about a new Messiah, a new Saviour who is in fact going to turn the world upside down as we know it. That's a tough gig. Unlike the other Gospels, Matthew's report of the life of Jesus commences right at the beginning, not with the birth of Jesus, but before that with a detailed list of the names of people who connect Jesus' ancestry right back to Abraham. Now, I'm supposed to turn this on. Do I, have I got to hold this for a few seconds? Guess what? Death by technology. Aha, it buzzes. Look at that. Okay, first slide. There we are. That's what I wanted to look at. Now, if I had known that it was going to be on a white wall, I probably would have chosen a different colour, but never mind, you can read it, can't you? Matthew does this in a very structured and systematic manner, without actually reading all of the names. If you read it in the King James Version, it would say, Abraham begat Isaac, who begat, who begat, begat, uh, etc. And the younger people in our congregation would pro probably say, what does that word mean, begat? Gave, uh, was the father of. So in the NIV, we, we talk about the father of. And Matthew does this in a very structured and systematic manner, articulating 14 generations from Abraham to Jesse, the father of King David. Then the second, uh, a second group, from David through to Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, you see why I spared Ruth all of this trouble. Uh, and, and you. Uh, and th then the third set of 14 generations from Jeconiah to Joseph, the father, the um, not biological father, but natural father of Jesus, the earthly father. And Matthew makes a point when you look at those three things there makes a point of adding some historical context uh, to the, the list of names by connecting the second lot from, uh, Jos if you look at that period from Josiah to Jeconiah, um, that is around about the time of the Babylonian exile. 
And that's a significant point, which we will come back to. That occurred in 591 BC, 591 years before the birth of Christ. And it ended in 537, some 60 years later, when Cyrus, uh, the, uh, the great of Persia, conquered Babylon and allowed the Jews to return to their homelands. And there was a reason why that Babylonian exile took place, uh, and Matthew doesn't actually specify it, but he does say uh, in that genealogy that this was around the time of the exile to Babylon. Matthew also makes another uh, interesting point in this genealogy, not mentioned here, but if you read through those first 16 verses, you will find it there. He mentions the name of four women. Now, this is most unusual in genealogy in those days, in Jewish genealogy. Genealogy was very important, and we'll come to that point in a moment as well. But to mention four women was unusual. But what was even more unusual was the women he mentioned. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba. Bathsheba isn't mentioned by name, but it is, um, um, but it is meant to be Bath Bathsheba. All of these women were of ill repute, promiscuous women. And what is more, they were Gentiles. They were not Jews. Now, that's an interesting point. Why? Did he do this when genealogy was so important to the Jewish people? We'll come to that point. What about this issue of writing into this genealogy the names of women and those particular women? There's a guy called Michael Green. He's an author. He wrote a book called The Message of Matthew, the Kingdom of Heaven. It came out about two years ago. Included in that book, he wrote this. Including women in the genealogy is unusual for a Jewish genealogy. Mark 6, 3 and John 18, 19 and 41 may allude to the questions about Jesus' birth. In discussing the women Matthew included in the genealogy, Green writes, why did he choose them? It is clear from Mark 6, 3, Galatians 4, 4 and Revelation 12, 1 to 5 that people were well aware that there was something strange about the birth of Jesus. It was different. The Jews put about the rumour that he was the illegitimate child of a Roman soldier and Mary. Nobody thought he was simply the child of Joseph and Mary. So Matthew may well be alluding to such rumours when he points out that in Jesus' ancestry there are notorious women. Sinners they may be, but God works to rescue sinners and to use them in his service. Now there's a big point to make, isn't there? And... The juxtaposition of sinful women like Bathsheba and Tamar with Mary, the gentle mother of Jesus, shows that the barriers between good people and bad people have also come crashing down. As Paul puts it, there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You've heard that, haven't you, before? And are justly, justified freely by his grace. Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> At the very beginning of the gospel, the, I'm still reading this, uh, the all-embracing love of God is emphasised. The women named here are all Gentiles and are linked with gross sin. Matthew is loudly proclaiming that God not only includes sinners in the ancestry of Jesus but that the kingdom of God includes a high place for women. Including these women prepares the way for the remarkable manner in which God uses the young Mary and answers in advance some of the criticisms of the birth of Jesus by the Pharisees and opponents of Jesus. The way that Jesus and the gospel treats women is the reason why women have been elevated in the Christian West and are treated with equality. So there's an interesting way of looking at that. Now, next question, why did Matthew start his gospel in this manner? 
Why? Why was it so important for Matthew to establish the genealogy of, of Jesus before he even starts to talk about the birth of Jesus? His purpose was to prove beyond doubt that Jesus is the long-expected Messiah, the son of David, that he was the legitimate heir to the throne of David and that his life fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies. And this is the important thing, that his life fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies. The emphasis was not necessarily on the right of Jesus to occupy the throne of David as the king of Judah. We know that that didn't happen. It was never God's intention for that to happen. But that he came from the royal line and was therefore acceptable to the Jews who never would have accepted any lesser pedigree. In ancient Israel societies that centred around kingship, genealogy served as public records that document history, establish identity and legitimate office. The key to legitimacy and identity was a direct and, and irrefutable familial tie with the past. This was particularly important in the context of descendants inheriting a throne. It was also important in inheriting birthrights and so forth. And when you look at it, there's not that much difference between that and what we see in the royal family in England at the moment, is there? You know, there, there she was, Queen Elizabeth II, she gave birth to four children. The eldest was Charles, <clears throat> second was Anne, and then uh, a couple of other brothers. And then Charles gets married and he has a couple of boys. Well, uh, that pushed Anne down the line a bit. And then Charles's boys have boys. And that pushes her further down the line. The, the heir goes to the eldest male of each generation. And probably, we could probably argue, some of us might argue, that actually the person who would probably be best suited to occupy the throne at the moment would be Anne. But she doesn't get a look in, does she? Now that, I'm not, I'm not inviting argument there, okay? Uh, um, it's just the way it was. And that was the genealogy uh, that Matthew was describing here. It was important, and in fact, it was in fact uh, important for legal purposes as well. But Matthew's challenge was to prove that this child, born of a virgin, outside of, or not outside, but conceived outside of marriage, was not only of Jewish heritage from the line of David, but also that he was the Messiah ordained from birth by God to be the saviour of the world. Now, at verse 22 and uh, 23 of today's reading, we read this. All this took place to fulfil what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's what... Matthew said in his gospel, where did he get that from? He got that from Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. More than any of the other gospel writers, Matthew keeps on coming back to prophecy. He quotes prophecy more than any of the others. His audience was the Jews and his audience depended heavily upon the fulfilment of prophecy. He quotes Isaiah, he quotes Jeremiah. He even goes back to Deuteronomy, which we'll take a look at in a moment. The irony in all of this opening to Matthew's gospel is that Matthew wrote it. Now you probably say, what's the irony about that? Of course he wrote it. It's the name, it's the gospel according to Matthew. Matthew is a tax collector. Matthew was despised. He was at the bottom end of, the, of society's list amongst the tax collectors. He was the guy who supported the reign and the governance of the Roman Empire by extracting from fellow Jews exorbitant taxes, all of which went to Rome or to the Roman Empire. 
and tax collectors were regarded also as corrupt. A dollar for Caesar and one for me, sort of thing. That sort of thing. We don't know for sure if that's the truth, but that is what is widely reported and often claimed. They were they were regarded as at the bottom end of the food chain. In Matthew chapter 9, we read of the story of Jesus calling upon Matthew to follow him, which he did, and he became a disciple. The first thing that Jesus did was to go and have dinner with Matthew and a bunch of his mates, the other tax collectors. And boy, didn't the Pharisees arc up about that. And Jesus' answer to that, a beautiful answer was, I came to save the sinners, not those that have already been saved. Now, the question now is this. How is it that the genealogy, genealogy of Jesus segues into the birth of Jesus, the story of the nativity? What's the point? Chapter 1 of Matthew's Gospel displays some very skillful writing and some deep thinking by Matthew. But more than that, it addresses an important aspect of history that would otherwise have precluded Jesus' right to be regarded as of the line of David and heir to the throne. Israel was under the domination of the Roman Empire and, as the book of Jeremiah puts it, no man of the house of David had been allowed to occupy the throne for 600 years. Herod was not the king of Israel. He was a governor of Judea, appointed by the Roman Empire. The man who really had the throne rights of the house of David was Joseph. He was a descendant of David's. And yet here he is as a carpenter. He's a tradie. Now, I'm not, not putting tradies down, by the way. Where would we be without them? My house wouldn't look as good as it does if it weren't for tradies. If I built it, it'd probably be falling over by now. Or I'd still be trying to get it finished, one or the other. Matthew, uh, uh, Joseph, could have been king. He was a carpenter. Betrothed to a young virgin called Mary. Joseph was never going to occupy the throne of David for God's word barred the way. There had been a curse on this royal line since the days of Jeconiah, right there. And his father, they were sinful, they were disobedient to God. They worshipped false idols and so forth. And if you read the book of Jeremiah, you will find there that God put a curse on the line of David. We read it in chapter 22 of Jeremiah. It says this at verse 30, speaking of Jeconiah. We read this. This is what the Lord says. Record this man as if childless. A man, will not, a man who will not prosper in his lifetime, for none of his offspring will prosper. None will sit on the throne of David or rule any more in Judah. 600 years before Jesus. And so we see Joseph, who might have been the heir to the throne, is a carpenter in a local community, betrothed to a young lady called Mary who had no pedigree to speak of, or Mary was a Jew. If you actually go to, to Luke's Gospel, and I think it might be about chapter 9 there, I'm not too sure, you will find the uh, descendancy of Mary. And it goes back to Abraham via a different line. And uh, in fact, Luke goes even further back. He goes back to Adam, which is rather interesting. But she had no pedigree to speak of, nor any claim to prominence. And as we digest this fact that our Lord Jesus came from this background and from a heritage that included Gentiles and sinners, ordinary people, I suppose like us, as we digest all of this, We can see why it was that Matthew made a point of commencing his gospel in a manner that clearly articulated 
the descendancy of Jesus through his earthly father, Joseph, not just from the line of David, but as far back as Abraham. Perhaps more relevant, we can also see, and this is the point, we can also see the will and the wisdom of God in instructing Joseph through an angel not to divorce Mary. We'll come to that point in a moment too. Divorce before you're married? Interesting point, isn't it? But not to divorce Mary, but to take her as his wife, regardless of her pregnancy prior to marriage. It was God's plan. This is the only conclusion we can come to. It was God's plan from as far back as Abraham that this would happen. It was prophesied by Isaiah nine centuries beforehand that this would happen. And that Jesus would come from that line. That Jesus' heritage would be exempt from the curse placed on on one of Joseph's ancestors and that Jesus would be the Christ, the Messiah, through whom God could manifest himself to all humankind and through whom humankind could repent and receive forgiveness and share in the glory of God's kingdom. Do you know what I find exciting about that? Of course you don't, I haven't told you. I'm about to tell you. What I find exciting about that is that you and I are the beneficiaries of that. The beneficiaries of what God had planned way back in the time of Abraham. If it weren't for a whole series of different things happening as they did, you and I would not be here giving glory to God now and looking forward to tomorrow. If Joseph had dismissed his dream as we routinely do. We have dreams and we wake up and we say, oh, it's just a dream, we dismiss it. If Joseph had done that, he would have divorced Mary. History would have been different. Now, as an aside, but a relevant one from, from that, it's, it's worth understanding, is the practice of divorce in those times. Betrothal or being engaged to be married was a commitment taken as seriously as marriage itself. It was virtually a contract. It was binding. It was a bond that could only be broken by a formal divorce. And the circumstances surrounding such a divorce were quite prohibitive. In fact, downright dangerous. In Deuteronomy 22, I'm not going to read it to you now, but there is a section in Deuteronomy chapter 22 which talks about the laws and what must happen when um, someone gets pregnant outside of marriage, when someone uh, has sexual relationships outside of marriage. And the man and the woman, according to this chapter in Deuteronomy, this is almost... AO reading, adults only stuff, you know. But according to the laws there, the man and the woman will be lined up in front of the, the, the woman's father's house and the people of the village will stone them to death because she has disgraced their father's household. Because she has disgraced her father's household. That's the way it was. Haven't we come a fair distance from that? Things are a little bit different now. So you can see Mary, pregnant, not married, is in a somewhat precarious situation here. And Joseph had it in his mind to quietly divorce her in the hope that this might not occur to her. And then he has this dream. Okay, now there are some key points. Key points. Here they are. Pedigree was essential. We're just recapping what we've looked at so far. Pedigree was essential. Matthew recognised the need to establish the pedigree of Joseph for purposes relating to inheritance and kingly status. Therefore, he addresses that need from the outset. The second one, Joseph was out of contention for the throne. Jeconiah, one of his ancestors, mucked up big time and was cursed and so was everyone else 
God saw fit to condemn Jeconiah's descendants to that extent. The third one, a Messiah was needed. God recognised way back, way back, the need for a circuit breaker, the need to overcome this curse. There would be a need to break the bond of sin and disobedience that had for so long imprisoned his chosen people. And then the third thing, God's solution. He couldn't allow Mary to become pregnant by natural means from, her, from Joseph. That would also have caught Jesus up in that curse. The only solution was an immaculate conception, as we have sometimes called it. And there it was. Fascinating stuff. Bringing those points together, we can see that the concept and uh, con conception and subsequent birth of our Lord Jesus the Messiah, through whom God manifested himself to humankind, and through whom you and I have access to God and forgiveness for our own sins, that conception and birth was not just risky, it was miraculous. Absolutely miraculous. Because of the curse on Je Jeconiah, the automatic entitlement to the throne ceased to exist. Because of the law of Moses, Mary could have been put to death in a brutal, violent way. And Joseph might well have dismissed that dream. All of these things could have changed history. And the miracles kept on coming. We know that after Jesus was born, Herod wanted him killed. And he dispatched all of his soldiers to kill the firstborn son in every household and make sure you don't miss that one. And yet, Jesus survived that too. We can see that there are numerous points at which destiny could have changed. The point is this. All of this comes together in four words. You're probably wishing that's what I'd got to the point in the first place, isn't it? This all comes together in four words. God is in control. That's it. Now, look, we worry about all sorts of things, don't we? I mean, we worry about what's happening, on, uh, happening in Gaza, in, in Ukraine. We worry about our relationship with China. We worry about politics. We worry about all sorts of things. And our lives are burdened down with all sorts of domestic things as well. For many people, Christmas is a difficult time of year. That's already been said. From my former days as a police officer, I can tell you Christmas Day is the worst day in the year for domestic violence. While many of us will share the day with family and loved ones, we'll eat up heartily and we'll enjoy watching children unwrap their presents and we'll probably enjoy our presents as well. I can remember as a child, I had a grandmother. Every Christmas I got a singlet. <laughs> Oh boy, did I look forward to that. Uh, <laughs> but whilst that's going on, others will long for the day to pass. Some will ponder memories of happier times, while others will worry about what lies ahead of them. Again, uh, and all of these feelings, all of these experiences, also typified the world into which Jesus came into which he was born. Think of the circumstances under which he was born. There was no pomp and circumstance, was there? There was just the most basic and humble of births. And it absolutely is a miracle that he was born at all and that he survived his infancy. Against all the odds, he came into this world, his mother potentially the subject of scandal and judgment by the Pharisees and others his earthly father precluded from the Davidic throne. 
because of a curse and Governor Herod going all out to kill him. But nothing could stop God. This is the point. God is in control. Nothing could stop God from fulfilling his purpose. If we worry about all of these things, just remember this. What we worry about and the things that are going on in this world today are just a blip on God's radar. That's it. It worries us, I know. But God's got it under control. Nothing could stop God from fulfilling his purposes from the Old Testament prophecies. Centuries before. And nothing will stop God from continuing to fulfill his purpose for you and for me in this day, in this world. I just want to read from something from Paul's letter to the Romans. You probably know what I'm going to read. You've probably heard it so many times. Romans chapter 8. This is what Paul... Now remember, Paul, the persecutor, Saul, the persecutor of Jesus, what a reversal he had in his life. What a miracle that was. And this is what Paul says in his letter to the Romans. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen to that. What a way to look forward to tomorrow morning and the days beyond. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. The birth of Christ against all odds is reason for us to rejoice and give thanks. And it emboldens us to look to the future, not with fear, but with optimism and hope. Are you doing it tough at the moment? Do you know someone who's doing it tough at the moment? We hold people up in our prayers. Hang on to that. Just hang on to that. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. As you celebrate the birth of our Saviour, may you find in him the blessings that will stay with you all the days of your life. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you that through him we can come to you. We thank you that you are in control. You created this world. You breathed life into it and into each and every one of us. And we know, Lord, that you are not about to hand it over to the powers of evil. Thank you, Father for your greatness and your power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much.